So Niki Franciscaki is professor uh, and director of the Center uh, of Urban Transitions at Swinburne University in Melbourne, Australia now. And um, since, well, two years now, one year, one year and a half. Uh, one year and a half. And you shifted. So we, we changed country and continent uh, sort of at the same <laughs> time. <laughs> um, but uh, of course, uh, you're certainly also very well known for having been a senior researcher at the Dutch Research Institute for Transitions for a very long time before that, um, and uh, have apparently worked a lot on a number of topics around urban transition and transformation, which is a concern that we obviously share. Uh, yes. Last but least, um, we are uh, co-editing, co-funding the uh, Open Access Journal on Urban Transformation, so one of the key reasons, of course, um, that... that um, uh, brought us together in our collaboration, but um, I won't say so many things more could I because I could continue on <laughs> for, for a while on that. Um, I will give you the word, Nikki, because uh, we are of course very curious about uh, what you would like to talk about today. I know it will be about nature-based solutions yes. as far as I understand, right? Um, yes. And yeah, I give the floor to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, first, let me thank you for inviting. It's an honor and a pleasure. I have prepared a lot of slides, uh, but they're all new and I will share my screen. And of course, I will be very happy after the presentation to share the slides as well with all of you. So I want to give a bit of a tour on nature-based solutions research, the current state of the art, presenting what it is, what it is about, how they connect with urban transformations and have one part that we zoom in from the research um, I have been doing especially on implementation and evaluation of nature-based solutions, but also zoom out um, and give you my perspective on the state of the art and where the research frontier is. First, I want to acknowledge uh, the country that um, my current research takes place from to acknowledge the traditional owners of the past, present and emerging. Let's start with having a common understanding of what it is when we talk about nature-based solutions. And for nature-based solutions are systemic solutions inspired by nature, harvesting the power of nature to deal with multiple social, ecological, and economic challenges. The recent updated definition of the European Commission involves also an additional element to say that nature-based solutions are those that also contribute to biodiversity. The question remains whether, of course, we consider the indirect and direct contributions to nature from nature-based solutions. What to remember and what to keep in mind when we talk about nature-based solutions is that we talk about integrative solutions, systemic solutions, that they are delivering multiple benefits and they have proven ability and efficacy to deal with multiple urban challenges. In research we have been doing uh, when I was still in Europe and also continues here in Australia and Asia, we see that nature-based solutions have the ability to deliver multiple ecosystem services, to meet, and it is very important, the co-production of ecosystem services across different socioeconomic, sociocultural, and socio-ecological systems. So an understanding of nature-based solutions as socio-ecological, technological systems is paramount so as and to examine them and to design them for maximum benefits, but at the same time also to evaluate and monitor them for their efficacy and fitness with a socio-cultural context. The hard evidence of nature-based solutions originates mainly from, from uh, water management and water interventions, especially about uh, flood protection and mitigation in cities and coastal resilience. However, by opening up the envelope and considering a multitude of these solutions, we could see that a more stronger narrative and stronger evidence base can be created that provides an alternative to grey infrastructure. And why this is important for cities is because a lot of 
medium but also mega cities they have areas that their infrastructure is really torn is really aging and urban regeneration programs need to take into consideration that we are living in a warming climate in a warming planet but at the same time urbanization pressures and, and demographic pressures in cities they also bring the questions of how can we make our cities more livable more just more inclusive and there is a mountain research to show that especially urban ecosystems have this ability to mediate into social spatial relationships and improve them but at the same time and being now in um, in an era of the pandemic we see that nature-based solutions are the health infrastructure in cities all the urban parks the urban rivers creeks are where people find uh, relaxation they connect with their communities and they connect also with the place they live a strong narrative and a strong evidence comes of course about their climate potential the climate adaptation but across different um, uh, different ecological gradients my research have been mostly and majorly in cities. However, I'm, I'm fully aware uh, of the work that is being done and transferred and tailored to city across different type of ecosystems and habitats. Now let's zoom in. This evidence um, exists. Uh, these solutions exist in different shapes, in different scales. And the challenge over the past years, especially with uh, a European agenda of Horizon 2020, having invested 160 million in projects on nature-based solutions over the past years into how do we bring these solutions in cities? How do we design, plan and govern them? In a systematic review we did with 1,700 papers back in 2017, we identified not only the multiple benefits, but also common phases of implementation to move from a proof of concept into making nature-based solutions reality in cities. We saw and we identified that a core to this is how you monitor and create a policy learning uh, process that actually connects the knowledge and the skills across all the different phases. And this only so important to have this continuous monitoring assessment and evaluation so as to be able to upscale uh, nature-based solutions at city-wide scale you might say this is very conceptual even though it draws from evidence and from practice and from academic literature and of course it's not that simple just to say we have identified we know how we do it there is ample of evidence here is a tool for cities to progress and to leapfrog towards implementing nature-based solutions. Looking closer in three really progressive cities in Europe um, that they have a lot of experience with um, restoring nature, a lot of experience with engaging with uh, civil society and with communities. Um, we identified a set of policy needs for the implementation of nature-based solutions. You might say that what we find is not very surprising, but at the same time, it is very important for where future research and future science policy interface needs to put um, a closer look. As you see, I don't know if you can read the cities or it is my screen of the faces. Can you see my slides? Someone? Okay, so I give a little bit of an overview here. Why to focus on knowledge needs? Because cities through city networks have been receiving a lot of trainings, a lot of knowledge transfer, and even a lot of very tailored um, knowledge change programs. But what cities need is actually to understand what would be the monitoring and evaluation frameworks to make the implementation and policy learning uh, more effective and more fit for their needs. In terms of skills and also relating with their knowledge needs, more and more cities recognize the importance of civil society initiatives and of social innovation. What we found surprising across all the cities is 
they do know how to engage with citizens, they do know how to do participatory planning, but they find very different how to engage with social innovation, how to understand it, recognize it, and also how to take on board social innovation initiatives for their planning of nature-based solutions. And in terms of how to create advocacies and par advocacy coalitions, partnerships, learning alliances, and in general, how to put in place collaborative governance. Again, working together with social innovation initiatives have been highlighted with actually all the cities. And engaging with new methods of co-creation and co-production has been highly, uh, highly recommended and, and highly motivated by the cities. What this means, it means that cities start across the globe to actually recognize how important it is to put collaborative governance in place, to invest in partnerships, to invest in experimentation, but at the same time, adapt more innovative approaches. In a study we did um, with colleagues from the University of Melbourne and with the city of Melbourne, um, the resilience office, we found that there are some specific policy levers that are actually fundamental for having more innovative approaches for metropolitan governance of nature-based solutions. Just to remind you in terms of scale, Melbourne is one of the mega cities. It's 6 million people and is very highly sprawled. The urban density is not at all very high and in terms of size, it's actually twice or three times the Netherlands. And this is very astonishing by seeing not only the density issues, but also how nature is appreciated, is brought back to the city, but also the different governance challenges in this part of the globe. At the same time, very similar um, implementation uh, opportunities, implementation lessons, but also the importance of understanding and giving uh, a different notion of actionable knowledge that comes from science. Back to Europe, as I said, nature-based solutions um, can be proven very efficient solutions and effective solutions, especially when we deal with urban regeneration challenges. And that's because they, can, they are cheaper, um, they can be maintained over a long period of time, and they can uh, regenerate neighborhoods by reconnecting with nature. Many cities in Europe and around the globe, of course, they face urban regeneration challenges from open sewage systems. They need to find a, a different way of dealing with urban waste, but also with urban drainage during flooding periods with um, eroded pavements and um, uh, lake fronts and river fronts around Europe, we can rethink and reimagine um, how our urban infrastructures would look in a way that they are not antagonizing nature and climate change, but rather are being resilient to climate change challenges. What I found impressive and what I find extremely interesting uh, when uh, looking closely and studying closely nature-based solution interventions across cities in Europe with a Resilient Europe project is where the most successful and impactful examples actually are in terms of place. This is a picture from Glasgow and this is one of the most successful nature-based solutions that are historical of historical and cultural value in Posil Park, in an area that is very stigmatized by crime and also that most of the nature areas, they have been seen as belonging to different crime organizations and gangs. Lumpy Hill um, uh, Stables, uh, the building you see, um, has been used and has been renovated to be an, a youth center, a community center, to rescue people, um, to have um, connections uh, with arts, uh, education, trainings, uh, but also providing um, uh, community dinners and community lunches, and also teaching um, the community of how to actually grow their own food, using constructed wetlands, using urban agriculture, 
and using also seeding projects across all the area for restoring the area from an old mine into a productive edible landscape. And of course, it does not stop here. In resilient Europe, and something I'm still monitoring three years after the project has finished, is the impact of those experiments. 27 different experiments were put in place. The majority of them, they related with nature-based solutions. They relate with removing paved um, areas, with daylighting um, urban rivers, with uh, planting and uh, have community stewardship of uh, pocket parks, uh, but also with uh, imagining ecological corridors and green corridors around the city to connect work with play, uh, with school, and with different activities across. Lessons learned from that, that they also relate of the transitions we want to see in cities is about mostly about how we can see different processes and different steps in the planning process becoming more inclusive, becomes more innovative, but also become more strategic in terms of uh, allowing and learning from urban social innovation instead of only engaging with it. And you hear me say again and again about the value of experimentation, experimenting with nature and experimenting for nature-based solutions, but also the value of um, embracing new approaches to bring on board people and to co-create nature-based solutions and through nature-based solutions. And here is where uh, transforming in place and transforming of place plays a very important role. We have seen uh, with um, uh, looking closer on narratives, uh, on sense of place dimensions, but also on sense of belonging of people when they are engaged, when they co-create their place with nature-based solutions that all these values they sift more positive uh, and more appreciative uh, understanding of the transformations that are happening. Transformations not only on the mindsets, but also on how the places look and how it improves in terms of environmental performance, but also social performance. Back in Australia, of course, what is different in all uh, research projects related with nature-based solutions in Australia is the aspect of scale. Um, in the green in the grey fields, um, seven year projects, large areas of in between infields uh, in the city of Murunda, they have been together with citizens, with planners, with architects, redesigned towards greener and also more connected landscapes. In no, it, a different uh, multi level governance configuration, a different regulatory governance in place, also required that next to the co-creation and experimentation, to the piloting, to uh, harnessing evidence, design guidelines, architecture guidelines, but also statutory planning, uh, planning change um, uh, needed to be all in line for this transition to happen. And this brings me to another aspect that we, we do talk a lot about planning and the role of planning, the changes in planning practice and planning theory, also innovating through planning um, with nature-based solutions and for nature-based solutions. We talk a lot about experimentation and co-creation for the governance of nature-based solutions. An aspect that we need to see more and more, especially in future research, is about the regulatory and the financial governance um, of these solutions for um, accelerating and contributing to uh, sustainability transitions in cities. And now the zooming out, what is the current state of the art and also what do I see from my perspective, uh, the future research frontier? In connecting nature that I was uh, involved on uh, full research capacity up to 2019 and uh, currently I'm sitting in the advisory board, um, we did a mapping of more than 2000 cases around Europe using all the funded projects on nature-based solutions. And we see that evidence showed us that 343 cases, 343 of these um, 
place-based examples have been actually upscaled to the citywide network. What other things we see is that in medium-sized and small-sized cities, the majority of the challenges that nature-based solutions that were found fit to address were flood-related challenges, whereas in larger cities, heat mitigation was actually a first priority of why nature-based solutions found a reason uh, to be in the urban agenda. Recently, I completed a review of reviews of nature-based solutions in cities with 40 selected papers. And it's astonishing to see some key highlights. The like five highlights I include here uh, as part of mapping the state of the art. First, and why I include the maps, is to show that there is a geographical divide of the research and the practice of nature-based solutions. The majority of the research and the practice looking on published papers, on public institution working group reports, consultancy reports, but also government reports, they come from Europe and the United States. The rest of the countries, including Asia mostly, Australia and Latin America are really lacking behind. There is a lot of research emphasis in Asian countries due to strong collaboration with European uh, research networks, but you can see really the, the north and south divide. Currently, all the evidence that we are gathering and we have of the state of the art of nature-based solutions in cities comes from the global north. The second aspect is that we see that nature-based solutions are proliferating and they are succeeding in being an umbrella concept, a concept that actually brings together interventions, knowledge, evidence across uh, a wide array of different disciplines, from urban forestry to green infrastructure, ecosystem services, ecosystem-based adaptation, water-sensitive uh, urban design, sustainable urban design, and on and on. What else um, I found and I want to share with you in terms of the state of the art? When back in 2014, Hass et al. did a similar review of the state um, of the art of ecosystem uh, services, their application and knowledge in urban areas found a gap of knowledge on how uh, urban ecosystems contribute to public health. In 2020, six years after, I have to say that it is astonishing to see how many review papers they actually confirm about amounting evidence across the globe about the positive health effects from engaging with nature in cities. A second aspect that I already, of course, said in the beginning is research is recognizing efficacy of nature-based solutions across socio-ecological urban challenges. However, a majority of nature-based solutions, they really address water-related challenges and especially flooding. But over the years, um, all the review papers and also our research, especially um, with uh, engagement in global projects, indicates that research and practice of nature-based solutions is really globalizing is um, in Asia, Australia, New Zealand, Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as Africa, are really building um, evidence on nature-based solutions, adopt a more active science policy interface. And this also brings us to um, the evidence that we are working on and connecting the community of nature-based solutions through a network of networks that is Natura. And six research frontiers. The issue of justice and how nature-based solutions contribute to the justice in spaces, to the um, equality, to constructing, driving, shaping, designing just cities. I have to say it is quite of a big frontier. And currently the research uh, community is, is very much divided. There are a lot of, um, there's a lot of recent research on um, 
impacts and cases of eco gentrification where urban greening has been used to actually drive um, a social divide um, to rule out and uh, gentrify areas, increase property, uh, property prices, and actually make social divides even harder. But I find that we need to also be more critical to this. Research that investigates the roles and the intersection between nature-based solutions and just cities and just city transitions need to also investigate what are the blind spots. What we do not see in the bigger, more systemic landscape processes of transformations that play out a role in justice and injustice in cities. The second frontier is about innovating cities with nature-based solutions. And how can nature-based solutions be leverages or be mediators for broader urban innovations in planning, in governance, in regulation, in financing? Can they promote institutional diversity? Are there as physical interventions able to create the disruption we need for more um, fast-paced uh, transitions to sustainability in cities? There, that's also another frontier. How they relate with bigger processes and how can they instigate bigger processes? The third frontier is about the evidence, the evidence that we build into making a case for nature in cities. How can we move and how can we bridge the north and south divide in evidence? Especially given that we are living in a warming planet uh, and the climate change is also changing the ecological habitat, the ecological gradients, but also the conditions uh, that nature-based solutions can be productive into yielding these multiple benefits. Can we understand uh, not only how they help in regulating flooding, but what about droughts? What about uh, native plantations? What about invasive species? More and more, we see that citizen science is also being used to uh, go beyond perceptions of nature in cities and also move into monitoring and evaluating especially biodiversity and species indicators about nature-based solutions. However, all recent evidence shows that this interface needs a more systematic approach. And the last frontier is about how big data, sensors, um, IT, can also contribute to understanding the potential, understanding how nature-based solutions play out um, in bigger changes and bigger transformations in cities and go beyond just measuring nature performance and ecological performance of them. And that's it. Thank you. I don't know how good or bad I did on time. I just know I spoke fast. <laughs>